from the worlds of the Genesis of Androzani advent calendar. The December Dump. Callum, what is George R. R. Martin's favourite shampoo? Uh, uh, I don't know. He doesn't mind. He just picks Daenerys. I don't even think I know that one. He that picks, shampoo. He picks Daenerys. Oh. Yeah. Oh, I thought, he, <laughs> I thought that was a shampoo. No. Uh. Hello and welcome to our reaction <laughs> and review of Season 3, Episode 8 of Game of Thrones. It is called Second Sons. Um, you can check us out on patreon.com slash genesis of Androzani if you want to contribute to the channel. We have access to the full-length reaction to these episodes on there. We also have early access to this video and requesting verse for us to do. Twitter.com slash Giandrazani is where you get in contact with us and get involved in the discussions. Or if you want to join our Discord server we have now launched, that is oh also God. in the description. Even though when this probably goes out, it'll probably be a couple months <laughs> way after. Yeah, that's true. Um, I also have a letterboxed account as well if you want to see some... You know, film reviews that I've been doing. The reason why I'm wearing a mask is because I just sprayed my room with fly spray. And I've no oh, idea. Oh, are you wearing a mask? I am wearing a mask, yep. <laughs> Hopefully it works like a pop filter, that'd be good. <laughs> the reason why is because I just sprayed my room with fly spray because I have fleas in my room. So, yeah, that could be a problem. Um, but, uh,. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Hopefully it works like a pop filter. Anyway, Callum, going into Second Sons, your thoughts and anticipations? Uh, we've got three episodes left. I feel like this episode and next episode, I think I'm we've seen a sort of trend that the show's doing so far, at least with its uh, seasons. These next two episodes are normally the sort of climax of the season stories. With the final episodes being sort of um, finishing off all little bits of stories here and there and setting up for next season. So I am expecting these next two episodes to be quite filled to the brim, I would say. Right. I'd be disappointed if that wasn't the case. Right. Last, the last two times we've had in episode eight, uh, we had the pointy end, which was a transitional episode between you win or you die and Baylor. Uh, yeah, that was tr that's true. I remember Neb, Neb was in prison for that whole episode. And then season yeah. two, we had the Prince of Winterfell, which came uh, before the Battle of Blackwater. Mm hmm. So. Yeah, if that's any indication, I suppose. But yeah, um, I've got nothing more to say, so shall we begin Second Sons? I guess we should. Alright then. There's so many more locations now than there was at the start. <laughs> oh no. There was like, what, like five in the first season? The lads are back. Oh no. I don't like looking at fingernails. That's why I don't like watching Lord of the Rings. Because they, because the the story revolves around the ring, and it's people holding the ring, and the ho <laughs> that's true. Yeah, that's actually quite true. <laughs> yeah, and the hobbits have like bitten fingernails. It's disgusting. Gee. Is that the Blackwater? The Blackwater. <laughs> Your uncle's marrying one of the Frey girls. So quit trying to bash my skull in. We might just make it there in time for the wedding. <laughs> so many fucking weddings. Yep. <laughs> None of them are in love, except well, I suppose. I suppose season two, yes, but not this one. How many? Two thousand, your grace. Armored and mounted. Hmm. We can give you two thousand now, <laughs> plus fifteen when we get to Alderaan. <laughs> 
Hey! Hey, it's the guy in Deadpool. <laughs> swear I fucked you once in a pleasure house in Leeds. Mind your tongue. Why? Do you fucking wish? <laughs> she licked my ass like she was born to do it. <laughs> I would pay you as much and more. Jesus Christ. Fucking. Do you think he likes women? No, I think he hates women. <laughs> Sir Barristan, if it comes to battle, kill that one first. <laughs> Here we are. Well, well. Mm -hmm. Time to finally meet his uncle, eh? Yeah. So yeah, she didn't bring him back to King's Landing, but they went past it. Mm. Took him to Dragonstone. Oh, this music is really good. He looks thinner. Mm hmm. Show the boy to his chambers. Have the maid storm a bath and find him some decent clothes. Oh my you. god, you can get clean! Targaryen. Rod. <laughs> Rod. Fag. The one spoiler you knew about this season. Mm hmm. Me. <laughs> God. <laughs> to swallow a, a, a horse hole. <laughs> I never believed, but when you see the truth, when it's right there in front of you. As real as these iron bars. How can you deny her god is real? That was a brilliant scene. Mm -hmm. By the way. <laughs> well, I'm with Ulis. Dario does the deed then. Well, I'm with Ulis. That scene felt like it was very clearly ADR. I don't know why. I think all of Yunkai is at the moment. Yeah, probably. But that one I think was a bit more... Not as clean as other scenes. You look very handsome, my lord. Oh, yes. The husband of your dreams. <laughs> <laughs> Drink wine. When I have to. Well, today you have to. Isn't it bad luck to see your wife before the wedding? Mm. You look radiant, your grace. Mm. Radiant? <laughs> I like how you can she's trying to pull away but she keeps pulling her back and now the rains weep o'er their halls and not a soul to hear if you ever call me sister again I'll have you strangled in your sleep So now you know what that song's about. That you've heard. Uh -huh. The reigns of Castamir. Your father's gone. As the father of the realm, it is my duty to give you away to your husband. Oh, for fuck's sake, Joffrey. <laughs> oh, you cunt. He's always got to have his fingers in the pie. Sansa has such a fascinating story. Mm, it was really interesting. When for you sure. really think about it, this really subverts the whole, you know, um, princess being swept off her feet thing. God, myself. <laughs> oh, it's a, it's a wonderful wedding. Look at her ass. <laughs> Oh, what a cunt. Why? Just, just why? Oh, the Slovene's been replaced. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this whole like scene is like... A presentation of just how <laughs> awkward this is. Oh, it's like the set from Pan's Labyrinth. 
Love that. The sight of blood and fire. But I remember what happened last time. Yes, yeah, 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 we know. It. We know. We know. Also, I found out the isn't. actor who plays Maester Cresson was the actor who played Sire Bibble in the prequels. Oh, yeah, I th I think I mm. was thinking about it a couple of weeks ago. I think I was thinking about Phantom, Men Phantom Menace, and I was like, oh, it's the same guy, just without a beard. He's in Attack of the Clones as well. Yeah, and because they go to Naboo. I wonder what she's going to do to try and kill him. He brought me here to draw it from you and birth it into the world. Oh my god, she's going to do the sexism. Very interesting religion. The silent sisters, with their stern looks, muzzled mouths, and dried up cunts. <laughs> <laughs> Blood of a fat, drunk king, that's what he's got. <laughs> Gee, she's actually like, the actress is quite older than him. <laughs> mm. Like, quite a bit older. Oh, there you go. The bondage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's probably what he thinks it is. Aha, <laughs> ya fool! Oh. Get away! Not there! Not there! <laughs> So that was Joffrey, Balon, and uh, Rob Stark. Hmm. Their son will be your nephew after you're wed to Cersei, of course. You will be the king's stepfather. And brother-in-law. <laughs> when you marry the king, Joffrey's mother will become his sister-in-law. <laughs> and your son, I'm not sure. But your brother will become your father-in-law. That much is beyond dispute. <laughs> <laughs> this is bullshit! I know. Oh my god. Oh, pardon me, my lord. Of course, of course. En enjoy. <laughs> He's already drunk. <laughs> god, he's just so ready to make everyone's lives miserable. <laughs> I'm going to abuse Sansa because that's fun. Um. I am the god of jits and wine. <laughs> Shrine to myself. This is my favorite dynamic in the show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can joke. You can engage in juvenile attempts to make your father uncomfortable. <laughs> you can do your duty. There's so much love and hate between them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, please. Oh yes, I, I thought that was a very good wedding. If I uh, uh, this is myself. <laughs> Man, life sucks at King's Landing. <laughs> this man's meant to f marry fucking Cersei. There's one problem with that. Why is it so funny? This reminds me of the scene from episode one of season one. Like when they're having when they're eating. Yeah. It, yeah. It's playing the same music as well. Such an awkward feast. Mm -hmm. And the only one who's having a good time is Geoffrey. <laughs> oh no. Maybe I'll pay you a visit tonight after my uncle passes out. How'd you like that? I mean, I mean, Geoffrey, you don't really seem to actually get involved other than with your crossbow. <laughs> He's just doing it to intimidate her. Mm -hmm. He doesn't actually intend to because he doesn't want to. Yeah, I know. I know. He's a 
He's probably a virgin. There will be no bedding ceremony. There will be if I command it. Oh. You'll be fucking your own bride with a wooden cock. <laughs> <laughs> Made out of envy of your own royal manhood. My room is so small. My poor wife won't even know I'm there. Your wife is clearly quite drunk, your grace. <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> <Fuck>. <laughs> But it is my wedding night. My tiny drunk cock and I have a <laughs> to do. <laughs> Come, wife. I vomited on a girl once in the middle of the act, not proud of it. <laughs> I think honesty is important between a man and wife, don't you agree? Come, I'll tell you all about it, put you in the mood. <laughs> Why is this the funniest episode of the of the show so it's, far? It's miserable. She's being married to Tyrion Lannister. Mm -hmm. It's so funny. Astoundingly long. What? Neck. You have one. <laughs> you have. Yeah, she actually does. Oh. Yikes. This is so sad. <laughs> yeah. She drinks wine now. This is a really depressing episode. And this is actually like a mm. massive moment for her as well. And so my watch begins. Hey, that's cool. <laughs> that's cool. It all ties together. <laughs> oh, that was one big scene. Yeah. <laughs> what was that like? What was that, like, ten minutes? Probably. Mm-hmm. That was, yeah, that was great. Mm-hmm. What do your captains have to say about that? You should ask them. Rest in peace. Wouldn't this is supposed to impress me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I love that mm. Oh, yeah, that's great. I brought you breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> Feels weird being in the north now, doesn't it? I know. We've had so much, like, warm scenes, so many warm scenes. Yeah. It's a weirwood tree. Hmm. How hard could it be to build a fire? It doesn't matter. Come under the furs, we can keep each other warm. <laughs> yeah, <right? laughs> it's been a very romantic episode. It has. Of sorts. Yeah. Romantically depressing. I suppose it's a rather philosophical difference between a wink and a blink. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, <laughs> you read books because you're a nerd. <laughs> you friggin' nerd! His name's Samuel Tarly too? No. <laughs> Randall Tarly. Randall's a handsome name. Please don't name him Randall. <laughs> Is your father cruel like <laughs> mine? Different manner of krill. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say. <laughs> or crows outside, or ravens. Oh, it's just subjective. That's like a lot. 
Oh no. Oh. Oh, Sam. We all know you can't fight. Come on, Sam. Yay, you did it. Dragon glass. Mmm. Oh wait, did he leave it behind? <laughs> um, Jake actually used that shot in one of our projects at our film school. He mm. did a um, he did a TV ad. So we where there was a project we had to do for it with like TV ads. Mm -hmm. Um and. He, we had to do a trailer for the TV show Sleepy Hollow. And so as a transition from the show to the TV channel, like I didn't, you know, with the voiceover, he used those birds. He like masked those birds out and put them over it and used that as a transition. So like mm. the birds all came onto the screen and like transitioned into the final I didn't. That was pretty cool, I reckon. All right, then, Callum, your initial thoughts on Second Sons. I thought that was very good and probably one of the funniest episodes of the show so far. <laughs> I think in terms of entertainment, uh, I had a, a blast watching that one. <laughs> yep. But overall, in terms of the story, your sort of thoughts? But yeah, overall, very good stuff. Very, very good stuff. A lot of really good scenes as well. I think Tyrion was probably the biggest highlight, I think, in terms of uh, character. Mm. They very much focused on a few storylines in this one. Oh, yeah, They for put sure. a magnifying glass on it. There's a few, that, there's yeah, a few sure. that obviously got one scene each, but there was only a couple. It's like two or three that got multiple scenes. Shall we begin with one that only got one scene at the very beginning? Sure. And that was Arya Stark and Sandor Clegane. Mmm. Yeah, that little scene that right at the beginning, uh, yeah, Arya's trying while well, she thinks the he's sleeping, trying to kill him. Because that's pretty much what she's been focused on, wanting him dead. Uh, don't think we learned list. exactly. Uh, we learned that they're on the way to the twins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we know where they're going. Yeah, so the hound wants payment. Uh, he was he's yes. going to hand her over to Catelyn and Rob, and expects payment from it. So, in terms of him like ditching King's Landing, he obviously needs money to pay for himself, and handing her mm -hmm. over would give him that money. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I imagine they would pay quite a lot to make sure that one of their uh, uh, daughters slash sister uh, safety. Mm -hmm. The interesting detail of that, though, is if you remember back to season one, um, part of the promise that they made to Walder Frey was not only that Rob would have to marry one of Walder's daughters, but Arya would have to marry one of Walder's sons. Yeah... That's true. So if they make it there, she may be back with her family, but then she may be forced to marry one of one of his sons, and then obviously there would be a conflict with her and Rob because then she would say, "Well, why do you get to, you know, decide why the decide, and decide. I don't? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, she has true. no idea that this is about to happen if she gets there. Yeah. Because she wasn't there. She didn't consent to the agreement because she was just a child and she was with Ned in King's Landing at the time. Um, but yeah, I thought it was a really good scene, and the, I loved the psychology around when she was aiming the rock at him, saying, you know, uh -huh. if you hit if you hit me and kill me, I'll die, but if you hit me and I don't die, then I will kill you. Yeah. It um it reminds me of the scene from episode two, 
when Jamie and Brenna are on the bridge, when he said, you know, if you if you kill me, you'll fail your mission to return me to King's Landing from Catelyn, but if you don't kill me, I'll kill you. Slightly different circumstances, mm-hmm. but similar conflict. I and the Helm will be going to the Twins, and so we should expect to see them arrive for the wedding of Edmure Tully and one of the Frey mm-hmm. daughters that we don't even know yet. Lots of weddings yeah. at the moment. So many weddings. Yeah. But yeah, uh, that I've, I don't have much more to say uh, beyond that for that scene. So shall we move on to one of the bigger storylines that we got this episode? Yes. Well, obviously the episode's name is Second Sons, so we have to talk about Yunkai, where the Second Sons are. They are essentially a group of, I think I said, was it a thousand or two thousand cell swords? So it's a uh, I believe so, yeah. I think it was a thousand. And basically, think about it like, imagine if it was like Bronn of Blackwater, except there was a thousand of them in an army. That's kind of what they are. Though you mm-hmm. probably have to imagine that not not all of them would be as skilled as Bronn, because he's quite high level sellsword. But um, the the point still stands. They are an army of sellswords, which is that is quite that is quite a that would be quite a get for her for Daenerys. So, what were your thoughts on that storyline with Daenerys and these sellswords? I thought it was a, a interesting sort of. Um... I would definitely say it was sort of the like side plot of this episode overall, and I think it was decent. I think I definitely think. Oh, what's the character's name? Darian Harris. Yes, I definitely think he was probably the best part about it. I think wait, his wait, character is actually quite. In... Deadpool. Yeah, I think I think his character is uh, quite interesting. I think he and there's a lot of mystery to him. It's but I think in the way how he claims to be a simple man, but he very clearly isn't. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, for sure. I th- yeah, I think I think he's a very intriguing character, mm-hmm. to, for sure. And it's gonna it, obviously knowing that he gets recast because the actor had to go and commit to uh, yeah, filming cool. Deadpool. Mm-hmm. In a way, I'm disappointed with because I actually think he actually did pretty well in this episode, and I would have loved to see more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I think my favourite scene in Yunkai was the scene where, um, fucking his name's skipping me, I think it's either, because there's three uh, cell swords. one of them is obviously Darren Harris, then there's one called Prendal Nazgazen, and then there's one called Miro, and I think Miro might be the, um, the main one, the one in the centre, and I've got a feeling that Prendal Nazgazen is probably... The other one, the least distinct one. Yes, I'm correct. So, yeah. my favorite scene is when Miro sits on the couch with her and Dario is sitting next to him because Daenerys is playing daft to sort of uh, have a conversation with him because she knows obviously what he's after. He's he's not hiding anything, Miro. He's very upfront about what he wants and what he wants to have and his skills and whatnot. I like the fact that she sort of plays daft to um, give him a false sense of security. But what's interesting about that is she can recognize that he will believe her lying, or not necessarily lie, but believe her sort of um, the you know the fake personality she's putting on around him. But what I like about it is that Dario in that scene very clearly can see that she's there's more to her than she's letting on. And she can tell that he there's more to him than there is to Miro. I would say that was that was very clear in the performances. That mm-hmm. there was a very subtle conversation that her and Daria were having underneath whatever she was having with Miro. And, that, yeah. and it was very clear that it was all going over Miro's head. Mm-hmm. Um, but I I think that was probably my favorite scene from Yunkai. And then, of course, you got the third one, Praz Nal, or whatever his name was, who was essentially just exposition. He didn't really have a character. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, he didn't really. Um, but yeah, what did, what did you think of... Um, obviously, Dario Naharis assassinated his... Well, not necessarily assassinated, but 
he killed the two other second sons. Um, well, because he said that they drew on him mm. first. So, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I guess it's... The thing is, like, those characters were extremely minor and didn't mm. actually really have characters other than... Well, even one of them didn't actually have anything. The other was just someone who was constantly trying to sleep with women. Yeah. With, with every other sentence he spoke, yes, like it, it was kind of, it was kind of like <laughs> if he felt like he was like a caricature. Yes. Now, it, one thing I will say about this section of the story, this to me felt very Dave and Dan. It was, I would say, it was, abu- yes, it was sure. abundantly surface level. Oh yeah, it was for, for sure for surface level, and it was like it was competent. Well, and competent enough, but it yeah. was yes, I agree. It was so. Yeah. Oh. And of course, the reason why they've had to do this is because they've changed quite a few things from the books. One of them being mm-hmm. Daenerys's characterization, and another one being Daria Naharis as, as well. Um, firstly, like I've said in the show, she's an adult, and she's from especially from season three onwards, she's characterized as a very strong, uh, oh, confident yeah. female character. I think the last scene very illustrates the how mm-hmm. she. I think I d- it's like I do like th- when you get a show that's uh, rated uh, R, R uh, and you get like a, they can just show anything they want. I do like the imagery of a woman like I was she was in the bath and then she with like rising with no clothes on i think i like the imagery of that uh displaying how much power she has yes i do too actually it shows off that kind of like what kind of person she is i always like those kind of like uh imagery like sort of like scenes yes of course i do like that as well however mm. um when daenerys meets Dari naharis in the books she's still a child or at least she's 13 or 14 so she's around the same age as sansa and yes, it's told in a very different way, and obviously part of that is to do with the inner monologuing. But the thing is, it's very clear in the books that Daria Naharis has power over her, like uh, in the sense that she, as you know, being the young woman she is, having you know collected all these armies and done all the, the things she's done. Obviously, she is quite smart even at that age. However, the thing with Daria Naharis and the connection at this point is Daenerys as a child recognizes him as a dangerous man, but her being drawn to him comes out of her um, attraction for him. Whereas here it feels like she is very aware of him and she doesn't have feelings for him but she's using him she knows that he would be a useful asset and the second sons would be a useful asset and by him laying on the ground his you know the reason why he betrayed his comrades she has reason to believe that he wouldn't betray her and also the fact that he swore to her that he would protect her and all that but like I've said the, the the reason for them coming together is actually quite different from the source material because like I've said with the inner monologuing of teenage Daener- Daener- Daenerys we get the f- we get the whole conflict around her realizing that Dario is a dangerous man someone that's not to be trusted the fact that she has no idea whether she he would be beneficial to her or not but because she lusts after him she chooses him out of attraction which shows that she's quite a flawed character and one that understandably happens due to her being a young teenager developing hormones but we don't get that here because she's not a teenager and it doesn't seem like the motivation is lust it seems like the motivation is power so Mm -hmm. it's quite different Um, another funny detail is that Daria Naharis in the books has a beard and he has blue hair Hmm. Um, so that's something that I can probably think, regardless of what you did with the story, it probably would have been sensible to change anyway, because I feel like blue hair may not translate to TV as well as it does to a novel. 
it may come across as a bit silly. Yeah. But yes, the reason why this storyline was mostly surface level is because D&D &D were writing it, because they're having to make changes to it due to the fact that Daenerys, at this point, despite the fact that the plot of her story is still in the same place as the books, her characterization is quite different, so they're having to alter motivations and the context of scenes to fit the narrative. And that doesn't necessarily make it bad or, or anything, because I don't think that this storyline was bad at all. However, when comparing it, it's obvious that there is a lot of subtext lost, and this storyline to me feels a lot more surface level than the others in the show, which does give it that sort of... I don't, I don't want to say, like, taint, but it does feel mm -hmm. like this, in terms of writing, is, is a lot less interesting than everything else going on in the show purely due to the fact that it's not written the same way. How, how would you respond to everything I've just said? Would you agree? Would you disagree? No, I, I see where you're, uh, where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have... Obviously, I don't have much uh, reference. Uh, well, I'm much connecting to the books themselves, but I totally understand uh, what you mean by that. Mm-hmm. I, I, would say, where you're coming from. I would say out of every character in the show, Daenerys is the one that suffers the most from not having inner monologues. Because it's very hard yeah. to actually gauge how she's feeling inside because she doesn't show it. Yeah, we don't really actually know, like, sort of a... Uh, because our story is very much... I would say probably more in season one, we got a little bit more of what she actually felt mm -hmm. throughout the entire thing. But I think since then, it's been... <clears throat> like we know what her main goal is is to gain enough resources to be able to take back the Iron Throne in Westeros so we understand what her mo overall motivation is but we mm. don't know what how she feels as a person we don't really her get those fine details everything. we don't really get those fine details yeah, we don't. and that's I think to me that is, that's what's missing from Daenerys' story <clears throat> We don't really get the fine details. We only get the big picture. I agree. And mm -hmm. if we remember back to season two, one of the issues we had with the Karth storyline is it felt like Dave and Dan, obviously having changed quite a few elements, they stitched together all of the plot elements that were necessary, but we didn't get any of the breathing in between to see where and where these character decisions come from, how they're feeling, what they're thinking. We only get the plot points, and I feel like with this episode, I, I would say it was better handled than the Karth stuff with Pyat Pri. However, I would say that to the same degree, we only really get the plot elements, and the level of understanding of these characters' motives, thoughts, feelings was quite minimal. As opposed to other storylines where they managed to fit those character feelings, motivations, and thoughts very much integrated into it, rather than almost you know it almost feels like with this storyline i'm having to guess what they're thinking rather than it being abundantly clear or at least suggested because i feel mm -hmm. like the problem we're having is that daenerys is having to put on these put on, put on this very strong leader personality to appear tough in front <coughs> of these strangers but we're not really getting any of who she really is and the reason why I worked in season one is because when she was around characters like Khal Drogo or her brother or even Jorah, we actually got scenes where we got to see the real Daenerys. But it seems like ever mm. since she's come to the Slaver's Bay, we don't really ever get to see that anymore. <clears throat> Aside from a no. few, few very fleeting moments. I think that, for me, automatically slots this storyline into, into the sort of B-plus area because of that if you know what i mean yeah i understand because it doesn't have quite enough in its writing to achieve that top level that we've seen beforehand mm -hmm. so yeah it's it's difficult to, it's 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 an interesting one to be critical of because there's actually nothing wrong with what they did in the story it's just the fact that it's missing something it's kind of like um 
it's a bit like when you go ahead and you know you go to criticize like the Tom some of the Tom Holland the Tom Holland scenes and well sorry not necessarily scenes but when you go to criticize Tom Holland Spider Man films like outside of some of the more detailing stuff like direction and whatnot when you talk about certain elements of the story it's not necessarily that the things that they've done in the story are wrong it's just that they're missing elements that could make them way better if you know what I mean yeah I I see what you mean yeah. There's an element of that to it for me. Like, with the story in this episode, again, it feels, like we've said, it's like surface level. So it feels like, it feels like with Daenerys, like, since season one, she's been, like, just sort of drifting. I think this season is a little bit more focused on her overall goal, but it still feels like that we're just seeing her sort of just wander around and trying to gather res like resources and well, there's the, not much of a character growth. Well, the problem is, is there isn't struggle. Because that, exa that's, yeah, exactly. So it's, there's not, no it's real not that interesting. It's just performing tasks. Yeah, she just... This person who she had no real... Uh, effect on in terms of what she would trying to do this person decided on their sort of own terms to swear to her mm -hmm. and i feel like it, it the, the storyline shouldn't be dario naharis making up his mind whether or not to side with her and that being the tension it should be her whether or not she's willing to take the risk to accept him that should be the the conflict because that's and I think that would be far more interesting because she's the one we actually are invested in, the one that we want to see. You know, you're the one that, that wants this power, the fact that it seems like she can so easily take it and it's the characters around her that are having to figure out how to become part of her army, which is fine, but nowhere near as interesting as if you did an actual storyline where she's having to weigh up all the potential dangers. The only real indication we get of these dangers is from off-handed comments from Jorah and Barristan about what could go wrong. But it's not enough. There needs to be, like there was beforehand, there needs to be conversations where she that she has between her and her advisors about whether or not she can trust these people. And like, if there was a scene between her and Jorah where... Jorah is warning her to not trust Dorian Harris because, you know, he's an, he's a sellsword. But then mm -hmm. Daenerys sort of hints that she feels lust towards him, and then that upsets Jorah Mormont personally. Again, like, that would add so much to the scenario, if you know what I mean. It would add so much to the characters. And then, obviously... Yeah. If she recognized that he started... you could She could see jealousy on, jealousy on his face, it would then lead her to feel like maybe she could shift some of her trust over and then you could uh, then from there start to see her become more tr more interested in the idea of trusting Dorian Harris than Jorah which then would create character conflict but we don't get any of that that's the problem we don't get any of that at all we only get the plot points so yeah I think there's quite a there's quite it's quite a missed opportunity to not capitalize on this stuff if you get what I'm saying? Yeah. <clears throat> um, but yeah, that's what I've got to say. And it's just unfortunate. I just wish that Dave and Dan could see that there is so much more potential to what they're doing than just laying out the necessary points to have the story happen. You know, part of the reason why we love George R. R. Martin's novels is because he squeezes everything he can out of every storyline. You know, with the world building, the character development finding out how they feel, having cl natural clashes that make sense, you know, with character decisions that create tension. You know, we've had this before with her and Jorah Mormon, how, you know, there was that scene in Karth from the Ghost of Harrenhal that I said was mirroring the scene with Davos and Stannis, and how there was tension between them about her decision-making. Again, like, something like that would become would be very useful here, but it, but they don't do it. Mm -hmm. and it's a shame because yeah. they, they used to do that 
like if you think about season one, you think about the scene with Robert and Cersei, that's a scene with, that they added in that's very much like what I just described. It's not something that you necessarily need for the plot, but it adds so much to the characters. And the fact that they're not finding ways to either add it or they're not thinking to add these sorts of things in these storylines that they're changing, it's just a shame because it could be so much better than it is. Mm -hmm. So with all that yeah. rambling said, I think it really does put Yunkai in a different perspective. Yeah. It feels just slightly undercooked. Do better. <laughs> <laughs> right. Shall we move on? Yeah. Okay. I think I'm going to be a lot more positive here. Oh, actually, oh. no. To be fair, there is one element of this storyline that I w am questionable of. Um, mm -hmm. However, for the most part, I will be positive for this section, and that is the <coughs> section at Dragonstone with the Red Woman, Gendry, Stannis, and Davos Seaworth. Mm hmm So, I'll start, I'll start off with the potential negative first, and then, mm -hmm. and then we'll talk about the rest of it, because it's only an, it's, it's a minor slight. So I mentioned, I've mentioned in the, well, I mentioned in the Walk of Punishment review about how Stannis Baratheon doesn't really have a character arc in this season because he isn't sensing doubt. Um, well, he didn't sense doubt in Season 2, and we don't have that build to him starting to be tempted by the Red Woman after losing the Battle of Blackwater. The problem with him is that he's already on board and he's very willing to, you know, um, pff, sacrifice Robert's bastard, you know, because he sacrificed Renly. It seems like his attitude is very clear on the matter. But... The Having said that, the one place that I felt they really got him right is because he went to see Stannis. Uh, they, he went to see Davos Seaworth in jail, not to directly ask him for advice, but to imply it. And I actually really, really like that scene with him and Davos Seaworth. That's one thing that that D and D are absolutely getting right in, in adapting is is Davos Seaworth's character, because even though Stannis is a bit different. And he's a bit more static. At the very least, Devil Seaworth is exactly the same character you get from the books. And he is brilliant. I loved that scene in the prison. The way he said he had no regard for his own life. But he's willing to... Again, he's willing to speak up because he, he believes that the Red Woman is doing this the wrong way. He's willing to, he wants to, he's risking everything to convince Stannis out of letting her into power. And, you know, talking, and then I love the fact that Stannis strawmans the argument of killing blood for the kingdom by saying, I killed Renly, why not kill Gendry? And I love the fact that Davos criticizes that saying, but Renly betrayed you, this boy is innocent. Mm -hmm. That was brilliant. Like... Yeah, what he's saying isn't yep. wrong. Also, him trying to read was fucking hilarious. That was great. That was legitimately <laughs> really fucking funny. Fuck me. <laughs> great stuff. So, yeah, yeah, that scene overall was really, really good. Yeah, so overall, starting starting off, yeah, what, are you, what were your thoughts on Davos and Stannis in this episode? I thought that scene was extremely well written. Mm -hmm. Like, it had probably some of the best dialogue... Uh, of this season. Absolutely. I don't know what. I just felt the dialogue was just like incredibly like great for the deconstruction of their arguments they were putting forward towards uh, the potential killing of Gendry. Mm -hmm. I just I thought it was like like I like the reasoning of why Davos thinks that killing Gendry is wrong mm -hmm. when the argument of uh, killing Renly was isn't it the same thing? But no, it's I I like I just like the sort of like uh, the sort of character stuff with them in that scene. I think keeps them all nice and consistent, and it works really well. And it's great dialogue. And that's and that's the thing is that's the one part that they are getting right with Stannis' storyline is 
all of the conversations he has with Davos Seaworth because they are still consistent. It's just, unfortunately, on the other side of that, we're not getting his eventual build to trusting the Red Woman yet because he already does. He already has done. He He's trusted her from the very beginning. So we don't really get a character arc with Stannis Baratheon. We get a static character who's in an interesting storyline, but it feels like he's at a standstill. And the only thing that I'm finding new about him this season is the, what we got in Kiss by Fire with his daughter. It's the only thing we've gotten new from him. And it's a shame, because Stannis Baratheon in the books is one of the most popular characters in the series, and from what I've read about him, he is one of my absolute favourites. Um, and the fact that they've taken away some of that brilliant subtext from him is a shame, because Stannis is mm-hmm. great. But like I said, because it's still adapting, even if the character is static, we're still getting those brilliant parts of the story. And also on top of that, we're still getting the same portrayal of Davos Seaworth, which makes up for it, I think. Mm-hmm. For sure. So at this juncture, I'm I'm iffy on Stannis, but I'm still on board. Um, yeah, I'm pretty much in the same boat. Yeah, and th- this definitely wasn't as much as a blunder as the Walk of Punishment scene was, because that that was something else. That was very weird. At mm-hmm. least he still feels like he's in character for what we've seen in the show. <laughs> yeah. Um. On the other side of that, we have the Red Woman and Gendry. Ah, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that... I, I, I think from the moment she walked in, I knew exactly what was going to happen. Mm-hmm. Did you know it would be leeches? No, I didn't. I thought she was probably like a legendary attempt to uh, kill him. But no, she used the leeches to suck the blood of Gendry, because obviously he has royal blood due to Robert Baratheon. And then they burned three of the leeches and named Joffrey, Rob, and someone uh, someone from the Greyjoy Balon uh, family. Greyjoy. Balon Greyjoy. Theon's father. Right, yeah. That's probably why I didn't like remember his name, because he has only appeared, like, what, in two episodes? Yeah. Theon's father, Balon Greyjoy. It's, it's obviously the War of the Five Kings. Renly's dead, so there's only three others for Stannis. Yeah. I wonder what's gonna happen with those. Because yeah, didn't, they didn't explain like what uh, that's going to achieve, but I think you can sort of guess that mm, it's not gonna be good for those three. Well, the intention seems to be that Stannis is, is using blood magic to uh, foresee the deaths of the three other kings, which will get him on the throne. Yeah. Much like how he used Blood Magic to get uh, Randy killed. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. It'll be interesting where that leads to. Mm-hmm. I think the next two episodes are going to be very interesting indeed. Yes. Um, I think I mentioned in, a, uh, in another video, but may have been the last review or the one before that. This storyline in the books does not feature Gendry. It features a different bastard, Baratheon, uh, called Edric Storm. But uh, the showrunners have combined the two characters into one. Mm -hmm. Um, And in some ways, that actually makes sense. Because Gendry and Edric Storm, there's hardly anything that makes them different on the surface. So the decision to make it Gendry, for now, at the very least, makes sense. Um, because mm-hmm. we actually are invested in Gendry, so seeing this happen to him, we're a lot more interested in it than if it was just some random bastard named Edric Storm, you know? Because, of course, the difference being in the books, you have more time to develop the characters, so if you're reading A Storm of Swords, you're going to know who Edric Storm is, but because they wouldn't have had the screen time to develop Edric Storm, at the very least, as we know, we probably wouldn't care as much about him having the leeches put on him. So mm-hmm. the decision to have it be Gendry makes sense because we already know who he is. And it all fits because Gendry obviously being linked up with the Brothers of Art Banners who worship the Lord of Light, it makes sense why he would be taken by the Red Woman. 
So I think mm-hmm. it's a it's a very very lucky and happy coincidence that D and D had this window of opportunity to change it in a way that actually works. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. There is something I will have to say about it eventually, but not this episode. All right. But so far, it, it's very much lining up well. Would you say that um, Gendry being lured by Melisandre was believable? Uh, I guess so. Mm-hmm. I don't really have a, a problem with it. It's difficult to say, isn't it? It's a bit like um, yeah. when I was watching it, it reminded me of the scene with Theon uh, last episode. When he yeah. was seduced by Violet and Miranda. I think here it uh I think it works a little bit better because you know, Gendry has no clue what's actually going on. Yeah. With Theon it's it's pretty obvious. In terms of a uh, like the character would probably could probably figure out what this is. With mm. Gendry he has he has no clue. Mm. Yeah, the only th- real thing we have to go off with Theon is that it's been established that he's um, very addicted to women. Yeah. So his his um, temptations probably clouded his judgment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, King's Blood from the Leeches. <laughs> I don't know why she had to put one on his penis. <laughs> That's to get the. That's the for sure. This one, something bad's going to happen to this person. Uh, sweet spot. Right. What? Well, so because that's like, what. Is it's because it like it's. It creates life, so they use that to, to destroy life. I don't know. <laughs> what? Well, so is that each part of the body represents one of the three kings? So the the the, the cock represents the Greyjoys. <laughs> Then the stomach maybe represents, the the stomach represents the Baratheons, and then the heart represents the Starks. <laughs> Possibly, yeah. I've, if you probably asked D and D that now, they probably would say yes to uh, save uh, Faith. <laughs> uh, but it could, it could, uh, just a random idea. It could represent what is going to happen to each of them, maybe. I don't know. I guess we'll see. I do have some context for what this scene means, but I can't obviously delve into that. Yeah. Anyway. It's very yeah. Mer- very metaphorical. It's very themes, you know. <laughs> oh, so many themes. Let's move uh-huh. on to the part of the storyline that got the most screen time. Surprisingly, it wasn't in Yunkai. It was actually in King's Landing because we had the wedding of Tyrion Lannister and Sansa Stark. And I thought everything yeah. in King's Landing was brilliant. It was I agree. I've... off the charts. It was some of the best stuff we've had the whole season. Yeah, some of the funniest, most depressing, most uh, character we've had for a while. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was very. Yeah. Like, it was that whole thing was like a big stretch of the wedding. A uh, post wedding was like a stretch of ten minutes. We talk, just, we talk about Yunkai not yeah. having much subtext. This was the polar opposite. This had so much subtext. It had so much subtext. Mm-hmm. And it had the so much going for it. The performances all round were brilliant. Oh, yeah. Everyone Especially was pretty Peter much Dinklage. on top of their game. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Peter English was fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, when... Um, Peter Dinklage was nominated for the year of the Emmys that came out when the season was on, like the cycle of that season. Um, he was nominated for an Emmy, I think it was some um, like best performance in a TV series or something. I can't even remember mm-hmm. what it was, but he was nominated for that. And so for that one, he put this episode forward as his, like the the nomination, like to, basically, you know how people will put forward a specific episode or a specific like self-contained bit of material to put forward for the nomination this was what he used yeah. because obviously this was the the drunk of course, course. Um, course and it's his most dynamic performance in the whole season so i think yeah it makes sense why he would put this one forward 
because Peter Dinklage <laughs> was amazing in this episode. He was. He was not only so funny, but tense. The, the scene where he, you know, he gets very drunk, and it's hilarious. It's absolutely hilarious. <laughs> Especially, I love the dynamic with him and his father, with Tywin. That was great. You know, him saying, you need to consummate the marriage, and he's like, what do you think I am? I am the drunken lustful. And <laughs> Tywin's like, well, yes. <laughs> but... <laughs> One of my favorite moments from that is when he sticks the knife in the table. Oh yeah, that's great. And threatens Joffrey, you'll be fucking her with a wooden cock. Mm. Tywin tries yeah. to sweep it under the rug as a joke, but it's not. It's very clearly not a joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they talk about, you know, how alcohol brings secrets to the surface. You know, the, the truths you speak when you're drunk are the lies that you keep. When you're sober, it's very uh -huh. clear that Tyrion would love to see this boy dead. Especially yeah. after what Joffrey did to him at the wedding. Embarrassed yeah, him. Yeah, that. Yeah, very much. It was not a great time, but yeah, pretty much an embarrassment for Tyrion. Mm hmm. And the fact that he's willing to take the risk of not consummating the marriage because he wants to protect Sansa and her consent is quite brave. Yeah, it much is to, sure. Much to the delight of Shay as well. Mm -hmm. I think one of the most unique things about this episode is the fact that Shay barely had any dialogue, if at, probably like barely any at all. But we could tell so much from her facial expressions. In the scene when Tyrion asks her to leave the room, and then also the scene where she brings him in breakfast and checks the bed. Mm -hmm. You could tell so much about what she was thinking just from her facial expressions. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. It's good stuff. Absolutely. And you could just tell that Sansa was having absolute hell. Oh yeah, he was horrible for, for sure. That whole scene with um, her and Tyrion after the wedding, it's it it's like pure sad, like uncomfortable vibes that the scene is tr clearly trying to uh, present. It's it was done uh, really really well. Mm -hmm. The music was really good as well mm -hmm. in that scene. Another one of my favourite scenes was the scene between Cersei and Marjorie. Where, they, where Marjorie calls her sister, and then Cersei tells the story of why the Reigns of Castamere song was created. Which, you know, we, mm -hmm. that's a song we've heard before. We've had it featured as tracks for the episode twice. Um, funnily enough, it's actually going to be one again this time. Um, but... Yes, there was that conversation between Cersei and Marjorie about the reigns of Castamere and how House Rain was taken down by the Lannisters because they tried to overthrow them as the richest house. And now House Tyrell is now the second richest again, similar to the way that the House Rain was. Essentially, Cersei is laying down the threat to Marjorie, saying that if yep. you try and overtake me, I will have you destroyed. It's been very much sort of sweeping it under the rug sort of her dislike for her and, that I'd be, and now that was the sort of moment where she's like listen I fucking hate you if you annoy me like I will have you killed because I don't like you mm -hmm. I, th I think like uh, Cersei knows what kind of person she is? It's the because first Cersei time isn't in the whole stupid. series that Marjorie's been outplayed. Yeah, the, like her demeanor just doesn't work on her at, in any sort of way because Cersei's not like stupid. Yeah, and you can see on from from her expression, it's the first time that Marjorie actually has felt threatened by someone. Yeah. 
So that's going to be interesting going forward between those two. Because Marjorie's marrying Cersei's son. As so, Olena very clearly pointed out. Yes, there's a lot of complications of who is going to be related to who, to who and what sort of family title will each person have. <laughs> then, of course, we get a very awkward scene between Loras and Cersei. That was great because it was so brief, yet the perfect amount of time for that. And what they said was just great. Because they don't have anything... The only thing they have in common is that the fact that they're going to be married. Yep, That's it. They have nothing. Cersei essentially laid yeah. it down to him and was like, we all know you don't want to marry me. We all know that I don't want to marry you. So shut up and leave me alone. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Cersei hates everyone. <laughs> mm -hmm. And yeah, I really... I thought Tywin was great this time too, trying to control the situation, but failing to do so. Yeah, because he doesn't want... Uh... Like when Joffrey was being a massive prick to Tyrion by taking away the step, you see Tywin was like bothered by it, and then he looked in the crowd and people were laughing, and he's like, no, this is not right. Yeah, because it's bringing embarrassment to the Lannister name, because that's how he sees Tyrion, because he's a Lannister, and because he's an embarrassing little dwarf, it's terrible for him because he cares about his family's the respect his family has from everybody else mm -hmm. absolutely also Pycelle is still a pervert yeah he's finding replacements for Roz now that she's been killed yeah yep um, Varys and Bronn were there but they didn't say anything uh, the mm -hmm. High Septon uh, so the, the Slavine has been replaced. We now have a new Hive Septon. Yeah. That would have been funny to see the Slavine in that scene. <laughs> that would have been great. Yeah. Still haven't met the other Slavine yet. you got to wait for that. Mm. The father of Sir Weimar Royce, who died in episode one of season one. By the White Walkers, if you remember. Yes. Get off your horse. And the only other character in that scene that really got dialogue was Joffrey. He yeah. was at probably at, at his like in, uh, sort of like annoyance worse because he's obviously killed people, but uh, this is probably his most annoying he's been. Where he's for a just while. he's everything he's doing is to wind people up. Mm hmm. Uh, how he's like, I'm going to escort you to marry, um, you know, now that your father's dead, I'm going to be the one that escorts you to marry. And then I would, mm -hmm. he embarrasses Tyrion by taking the step away, and then makes fun of, you know, her and him, that the fact that they have to consummate, and he's like, oh, let's get it on, get it on with. Then obviously, Joffrey says, what did you just say? Yeah, it's like, his demeanor, like, turned. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there's the part where he says, you know, I might give you a visit after Tyrion falls asleep tonight. Uh -huh. Which he won't, because he, he's not interested, but he's, he's doing it because he knows it'll upset Sansa. Yeah. What a prick. <laughs> what a prick. But man, Jack Gleason is so good. <laughs> Yeah, he, is. he just he's so perfectly cast for this role. But he yeah, any, anything else you want to add on top of that for the King's Landing section? I thought that was all just crazy stuff for the entire thing. Mm -hmm. Well, the only other scene we got in this episode was the scene with Gilly, Samuel Tarly, and. A white walker, the same one that was taking Craster's children. Uh huh. Yeah, that whole scene was very um. Uh, I don't know what the word would be. Surreal. Uh, unnerving or something like Unnerving. 
Yeah, yeah, that because of the like sort of like ravens, like slowly mm. building up in like sound. What well, kind and of? Then you it see it kind him of, on the tree. Um, it kind of pays a homage to Alfred Hitchcock's Birds. If you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does it better than Praxis does. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I thought, that little scene uh, at the end to end the episode off, I thought was actually very well uh, put together. Well, one thing um, I find so interesting about their dynamic is the fact that Sam is one of the smartest people in the world because he's read so many books, and Gilly is one mm-hmm. of the, the least intelligent people in the world yeah. because of her limitations. So he's also called Samuel Tully. Mm-hmm. So she's one of the least intelligent people because she hasn't had any chance to learn because all her life yeah. she's lived under Craster. Yet, mm-hmm. somehow, they can still have this equal level of power in a conversation. Yeah, because of his sort of, like, uh, awkwardness towards conversations. Mm-hmm. But he has, like, a good, like, amount of knowledge. Yeah. And, and she's the a sort of, like... The, f- the thing yeah. about Gilly is she's not smart, but she has common sense. She has survival skills. Mm-hmm. So it's 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 like a nice little like they are they have their strengths but their weaknesses manage to put them on like a sort of like level in terms of like a mm-hmm. and also the fact that they can both relate having yeah. having had abusive fathers obviously Sam very much made it clear different kind of cruel yeah yeah but then and then we got the a uh, White Walker appearing, and then being killed by the dagger that Sam had. The one that he d- mm. dug up at the Fist of the First Men. Yes, which was like at, at the end of Season 2, or just before. Just so before he's had that a while now. Yeah. Yeah. He's had that a while now. Yeah, the Dragon It's really interesting, we learned, we learned something, that the Dragonglass is a weakness for the White Walkers. Mm-hmm. You stab them with it, they'll shatter into ice. Mm. Why do you think that is? I uh hmm. I'm assuming it's something to do with um uh, the dragons being quite a, a unit against uh white uh white walkers uh mm. thousands of years ago. Have you ever um cuz you know how there's paper scissors rock. Did, did you <laughs> ever play fire water ice? No. Well, it's kind of like I obviously need like a lot of people do like fire and add stuff to rock paper scissors, but no, not that version. Well, it kind of works the same way as rock paper scissors in the sense that um, water extinguishes fire, um, ice freezes water, and fire melts ice. Hmm. So it kind of, I mean, it's this situation is a little bit different. It's a bit more dual rather than triangle, but. In a way, there is a connection between the ice and the fire, which makes sense, considering that the series of books is called A Song of Ice and Fire. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, there is definitely a connection between fire and ice, and they're kind of two sides of the same coin. So you would Mm. imagine that Dragonglass has fire properties. Yeah, you'd imagine so. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Hopefully he picked that back up. It's Unless kind it shares. Um, it's a bit like um it's a bit like a glorified anti plastic, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> anti plastic. Anti plastic. The difference is that the anti plastic in Rose is kind of a self aware joke. Like Russell T Davies is like saying like this yeah. is a Deus Ex Machina, enjoy yourselves. <laughs> the Doctor just has a thing that will solve the plot, yeah. But we won't use it just yet, so we can have some character stuff. <laughs> yeah. Which is nice and funny. Mm-hmm. But yes, we are now aware that Dragon Glass can kill a White Walker. Mm. Yeah. Question: Does this make the White Walkers less of a threat? 
Well, yeah, by definition, yeah, they are less of a threat because now we know what their weakness are. So by definition, yes. But that doesn't mean that they're a weak villain now. Because we've gotten very little of them, with them still being quite threatening, that there's still more that could be... Like, we don't know, like, ha like uh, how powerful are they in, like, a massive herd, for example. Mm -hmm. So, yes, by definition, they are weakened, but it's not a detriment to the narrative. Yes. Also, you notice that the White Walker that was in this episode was the same one that looked at Sam in the season two finale and didn't kill him. But now he wa now he's willing to kill him because obviously he wants his baby. Well, he uh, well he could have killed him. He just threw him to the side and went for the baby. That's true, actually. So maybe he really just liked Sam and then felt betrayed when he got stabbed in the back. <laughs> You could come up with the theory that this White Walker is only interested in taking babies and it doesn't want to kill people, which is an interesting grey area for a zombie. Yes, that and is it's... a very interesting thing for a mindless husk of a body. Mm -hmm. And it's something that you would think, well, if that's the case, you would want some more development on it, because then you can explore as the reason to why... You know, this White Walker is specifically targeting these children. That would be interesting storytelling. Yeah. And you could actually develop the White Walkers as characters and not have <coughs> them just be a mindless hive mind. Mm hmm But, uh, we'll get to that. Yeah, it's just like it, it, I'm like, it makes you think, like, what if the only way that White Walker could have gotten the baby was that if it was, like, in a like cage, and the only way it could get to it is if it killed uh, Sam, for example, because obviously it let Sam live. Would it then kill it? Then would it or kill Sam then? So if that's the case, if why Sam wouldn't stood he? Why? Yeah. Why wouldn't then in that situation? Why wouldn't he kill Sam? So why let him live just randomly when you see him in a field like? You might as well kill him. He's not a White Walker, and you might as well get another White on your side. Mhm. Mm mm, it, it 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 is. I think it was uh, when we first watched it. It was we noticed it was quite a problem. Just thinking about it because well, after that, they didn't really explain why he just let Sam live, and. It's just, just a bit of a glaring problem. Yes. Um, I think making the White Walkers concrete is one of Dave and Dan's biggest mistakes in this show. Mm hmm Because the others in the books are far more mysterious. But yeah, because they... right now, they're continuing the sort of mysterious nature of the White Walkers. We don't know the full extent of... Just how well, the only massive thing and powerful they well, are. Well, the main thing that's mysterious about them is that we don't really know why they're doing what they're doing and why they're not doing what they're not doing. Whereas in mm -hmm. the books, what's mysterious about them is that we don't really know them. Yeah. However, this comes again at the whole cost of adaptation of when you're reading a novel, you can't see. So the book can very easily hide from you information. Whereas because we're mm -hmm. watching it, we're having to see it, so they've decided to make the White Walkers a lot more concrete. And with that comes a different set of stakes. And it seems like Dave and Dan are having this specific White Walker not want to kill Sam, and we don't know why. Mm -hmm. Will we get an explanation? Who, for who the hell knows? Well, D and D, no. They must do. They're the one writing it, and all that. They're just like, oh, they want an explanation. No, we can't do that. Exposition. Well, we don't really know why okay. they make those patterns either. You know, with like the corpses. Yeah, we don't know about that yet. We've seen that on two separate occasions. Hmm. Yes. Seems like symbolism, but we don't really know what it means. 
It's just sort of, is it their, is it their like, gang tag? <laughs> <laughs> is it the official White Walker logo? <laughs> like, it's just mark their territory. <laughs> Mm. Oh dear. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Second Sons received critical acclaim. Rotten Tomatoes consensus read Second Sons shines through efficient storytelling, a comparatively low number of storylines to keep track of this week. Uh, IGN uh, wrote This week's well crafted and wonderfully acted Game of Thrones gave us a cold wedding, a hot bath, and a bloodletting. He especially praised the scenes between Sansa and Tyrion and between Sir Davos and Stannis. I would agree, those were the best scenes of the episode for me mm-hmm. uh dave sims and Envy vanderworth wrote um sims was frustrated by the episode's meandering pace but praised the end of the episode with sam killing i didn't have a problem with the pace at all i thought it was very well paced it was i got very easily lost in the story and i kept forgetting about the duration so i would disagree yeah, with I, that. I thought the i thought the pacing was fine i think the only thing i could sort of like refer to in terms of something probably being resolved quite quickly was the Daenerys story of this episode. Mm, yeah, because we didn't really get that much of an in-between. Exactly. Other than that, I thought this episode was well-paced. Yeah. But the thing is, the pacing of that is not meandering. It was fast. It was very rushed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I wouldn't agree that this episode was slow and like sort of taking its time. Mm-hmm. Because I don't think that that's the kind of episode this was. Uh, he praised the end of the episode with Sam killing the White Walker as the most crucial, fascinating, electric moment of the night. I mean, it was certainly interesting and very exciting to watch, but there's still a lot left unexplained. So, yeah. Hmm. In, in hindsight, that scene could have some, you know, some damage done to it. Which, obviously, at the time of reviewing this, he didn't have, because he's reviewing it after having seen it the first time it aired. So I will give him some leeway for that. Uh, yeah, Vanderworth yeah, praised like... the use. Uh, Vanderworth praised the use of nudity in this episode. This is coming from a female reviewer, by the way. Uh, writing, actually, oh my God. Think, actually think Game of Thrones has gotten quite a bit better at utilizing nudity and sex in the midst of everything else as a method of telling its story. It's come a long way from the sex position days of season one, when it sometimes seemed like the series would toss some breasts in the background of a scene just in case we got bored of hearing somebody t- talk at length. <laughs> well, we've already been through this. No. Um, I mean, I, 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 we refer- I referenced earlier that I really liked the way they used a new tea with a Daenerys scene. Mm-hmm. I'd also say the same for the Melisandre Gendry scene as well. Yeah, I thought that was decent stuff. But and then I don't know why she's bashing season one. Like, I think it's fine. It's actually It actually makes sense because Littlefinger in the scene in episode seven is using his brothel as, a, as an analogy of what he's going to do to Ned Stark. What? It has purpose? Oh, sorry. Oh my uh, God. It's just boobs and blood. I didn't realize. No. Oh. oh. Yeah. Um. Anyway. Uh, incest. <laughs> Dragons. Also, one, one thing that's quite good about this episode is that we see quite a lot of nudity, so that when Sansa is stripping, you almost expect it to happen. But then when yeah. it, But when it does, and that's why it makes you feel so uncomfortable because obviously she's, she's fourteen. Yeah, they you, they literally have a, a Tyrion uh, ask how old she is to remind you of how old she is and then when she starts taking the clothes off you feel very fucking uncomfortable <laughs> mm-hmm. because you'd already seen main naked people in this episode before that mm-hmm. it just adds to that it does mm-hmm. so this episode was written by David Benioff and D.B. Weiss and what I can say is is that like a lot of their stuff, it seems like the things that they stick close to the novels is always the best stuff, and the stuff that they have to write themselves is always the lesser. Because when you look at the scenes with Daenerys and the scene at the end, that's very D and D, very surface level, exciting to watch, interesting but lacking in depth. Whereas you compare that to the scenes with uh, Davos and Stannis. And obviously the entire King's Landing storyline, it's a completely different story. 
Mm -hmm. So what I would actually say about this episode is that whilst it's it's actually a very well-crafted episode of TV, for a lot of it, it's actually quite an unfaithful adaptation in some regards. Mm. Which is an interesting perspective to take, I think. But overall, I would say still, they are still meeting <coughs> a standard of quality that I expect from this show. If you know what I'm saying? Yeah, still solid. Still solid. Still very solid. They're still they're not making any actual mistakes. They're just mm. lacking in some areas. There's, there hasn't been like a major plot breaking flaw in terms of right now. I think the closest we've gotten is Karth. But even then it was still competent. Yeah, sort of Karth and uh Yeah. Yeah, I'll say that. There's a couple of and the small, other one I would, there's a couple of small yeah. scenes that are questionable as well. Yeah, and sort of implications of that that could lead to bigger things. I think the example would be Sam not getting killed by White Walker. I think that's probably the Yes, the end of season two. Yeah, it's like at the time it's like it could lead somewhere, for sure. As of right now, we haven't gotten anything yet. So, at the longer that goes on, the bigger the implication will be in terms of it being a problem. Mm -hmm. There's also another scene that uh, we didn't necessarily criticise when we reviewed it. We actually praised some elements, especially the performance. Um, but there's quite a few people that are quite critical of the scene when Jamie uh, kills Alton Lannister. They see it as out of character because... Um, in the books, we never actually see Jamie murder anyone uh, outside of a battle. Um, in the entire books, up to the scene in the bathtub. But because in the show, we actually do see him kill someone in cold blood. Some people feel it's a bit out of character. I found it pretty. Especially someone in character uh, to me. Someone in his own house as well. It's questionable. Um, but I'm not sure. sure. Because mm, mm, that's a tough one. I feel like in that situation, Jamie does what he needs to do so, yeah. to survive, to be able to go back to King's Landing yeah. to it's save a, Cersei it, it, because of a, this war. It's a complicated situation because Alton Lannister is not a book character. It was made; he was made up for the show, so it, the plot could link. And they used him. Mm. They obviously said, "Well, at some point, he needs to die." So they used his death to have Jamie escape prison. And then he also yeah. ended up killing Torrin Karstark as well. Which, mm, it feeds perfectly into the storyline with Catelyn and Rickard Karstark and Rob. Yeah. But then for mm -hmm. Jamie, you could say that his decision was slightly questionable, the fact that he would murder someone of his own house to escape prison. I don't know. I think that, I think there's both, both sides of the debate have validi validity. One thing I will praise about this episode quite a lot is the direction by Michelle McLaren. Mm -hmm. I thought all the way through it looked great, especially the color grading. There was a lot of reds in this one. There was, there was, there was actually. So like sort of like golden and also with red. Mm. There were a lot of red gowns at the wedding, but then there was also a lot of red in the Gendry Melisandre scene as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, overall, I thought the color grading was great, and uh, uh, just the direction in general was very, very well done. There was a lot of great blur shots, a lot of great transitions. Uh, what was the transition that we remembered? It was like, um, I can't actually remember what it was. I think it was possibly transitioning from like a great to a great. I think the second one was Tyrion behind the great uh, in the bedroom, but I can't remember what the first one that was leading into it was. It may have been Davos's jail cell. It may have been the window of, that was in the room that Gendry was being tortured in. I can't exactly remember. But there was a great transition there. Yeah, and overall, I just thought the direction was great, especially all the King's Landing scenes. They were so well shot. E everything was... The way it was blocked and framed just told the story exactly the way it needed to, and it highlighted the performances in the way it needed to as well. Mm -hmm. And like you said, you made the comment of when Sansa walked in the room, it all went quiet. Yeah, it was mm. like dead silent. Because I think mm. what that scene did really well at is really through the lack of noise show the awkwardness yep. of the entire thing. 
And I like the scene where when Joffrey takes the step away, they make it awkwardly long, so you cringe. Yeah, exactly. It's good stuff. Mm. And the the shots in the scene with Stannis and Davos are great, with showing Davos behind the the bars, and like the the, the way mm-hmm. their faces were like framed inside of the squares of the of the the jail cell. Yeah, good stuff. Very good. Yeah, direction it's... was top notch. It was. Oh, and of course that final shot, that final shot of the crows, the way the crows were shot were great as well. Um, and also, like you said, the scene in, with the bathtub and Yunkai as well was very well shot. Yeah, I yeah, it was for sure. Mm. All right, the music by Raymond Javadi. I thought the music was very solid this uh, this episode. Mm. The first track we're going to be listening to is called White Walkers. Uh, what did you think of that piece of music, White Walkers? I thought it was nice and atmospheric. I thought it was a uh... yeah, it's quite, quite a for them. bombastic theme, isn't it? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, this felt very. I would say it felt very Murray Gold esque. Mm. Yeah, for you know sure. What I mean, I mean, at least one of his louder themes, rather than because obviously Murray Gold has a has a range. I'm not trying to bash the man. I love the man, but it felt very. Like, this is the White Walkers theme, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I like the I like the the sort of broken sound it has to it, and the, the beat's cool too, the do, 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 da, da, da. Like, it's very triumphant. But it still has that uh, sound to it, that old sound to it. I would say that mm-hmm. the music for the White Walkers has definitely evolved, though, because if you remember, the the music they used for season one for the White Walkers was very different. Felt a bit more closer to what the book suggests about them, whereas this theme is a lot more, I think, in the eyes of what D&D has presented as the White Walkers in the show. Um, but yeah, I would say this theme is definitely fitting for them. Mm. Though I will for say... Sure. I will say though, for a show that has so much brilliant music, this is probably one of the ones that I don't favor as much. 
And yeah, it's, it's good. It's probably because it's a bit more simple than the, some of the others. It is quite simple, I will say that. Yes. But it's still very good. Of course, that then brings us to one of my absolute favourite tracks, <laughs> which is another version of The Reigns of Castamere. We've listened to that song twice. Uh, for season one, for season one, and one for season two, I believe. I could be wrong about that. The version that we're going to be listening to right now is called A Lannister Always Pays Its Debts, and it's the instrumental version of the Lannister theme that plays as score, as non-diegetic score for the Lannister theme, rather than the diegetic song that we hear in the show, if that makes sense. Right. That gave me goosebumps. That was really good. That is one of my favourite pieces of music from this show. See why. Not only is it great, like, just great to listen to, but it fits the Lannister house so perfectly. Oh, for sure. The fact that this song, as Cersei described in the episode... It was written to represent them destroying a house for challenging them. Mm-hmm. Which, you know, it goes with their, you know, the sigil being the lion. It's just... Oh, and then just the way Raymond Javadi finds the way to create the music from the source material that George has written and make it this beautiful banger of a piece. It's just... I love it. I love everything about this. It's epic, it's it's grand, and it I couldn't think of a better theme for the Lannister house. It's really good. Mm. I, th- I think the instruments are used are very well uh, put together with how the song goes. I think it's very, very, very well suited to the Lannisters for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's nice to get again another version of that theme again. Mm-hmm. It's it's pretty much become the most iconic theme in, in Game of Thrones as the reigns of Castamere, and I can imagine so. Is the reason why they I think I'm not hundred percent sure in this, but I think they feature it on every soundtrack, at least once. So this time around, we got a Lannister pays, always pays his debts, which is the instrumental version of it that plays as non-diegetic score in the episodes. 
and I think there was a quiet version of this thing <coughs> that was playing during the scene with Cersei and Marjorie. But yeah, I love the way that they... This season especially has made music such an integral part of the story. Because obviously with this, you know, this, this song relating to the scene with Cersei and Marjorie's storyline. But then you've also got the Bear and the Maiden Fair with Jamie and Brienne as well. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think it's very clever. Very clever. Anyway, what time is it now for? The trivia. This is trivia. This is trivia. Oh, you should not tell you about the trivia. Is, is that how Pycelle pulls? He talks about the trivia of Westeros. <laughs> there was a two-week break between Second Sons and the next episode um, due to the Me- Memorial Day holiday in the United States. Since HBO is a premium channel, that they usually don't bother skipping holiday weeks as network and cable broadcasters do. However, last season, Blackwater aired over Memorial Day and took a slight dip in TV ratings. So HBO opted to just take it the week off for season 3. Funnily enough, um, I believe it was Doctor Who Series 3 had the same thing. Well, um, I think it was after... It was either after I think it may have been after Lazarus Experiment or Forty Two. They took a break uh, because of something that happened, and then obviously that happened again with Series Six. There was a break, and then of course Series Seven as well. But that was for different reasons. <laughs> so yeah, sometimes right. these events can up and can upset. So yeah, uh, if you're watching Game of Thrones, you would have had to wait two weeks for the next episode. Hmm. But I suppose, again, like like the trivia says, it's probably because Blackwater took a dip and they wouldn't want people to miss out on watching episodes, you know? Because like, people watching episodes together as it airs is quite a big part of the culture. The title of the episode refers to the Second Sons, a mercenary company in Essos, which is led by Miro, nicknamed the Titan's Bastard. The second sons in the TV series have been condensed with a second mercenary company which Marine hired, the Stormcrows. In the books, Mero is the captain of the second sons, while Prendal Nargazen is the captain of the Stormcrows, and Dario is Prendal's lieutenant. On a looser level, the entire episode deals with the second sons of various forms. <laughs> so now we're getting to themes. Tyrion Mm -hmm. is the spurned younger son of Tywin Lannister, so he's the second son, and is being forced into marriage to further his father's plans. Sandor is the second Clegane son, but unlike his brother Gregor, has turned his back on the Lannisters. Stannis was the second Baratheon son after Robert, and is struggling with how to claim the throne of his deceased brother. Gendry is functionally a second son a less well-regarded son due to his bastard status. Similar to Gendry, Samwell talks to, uh, with Gilly about how his father was cruel to him, even though Sam was actually his father's firstborn son. He actually considers Sam a disgrace and functionally the second son behind Sam's younger brother. So how do you feel about those themes? This is just too many themes to comprehend. <laughs> I've noticed too that many. Season, season three has had a lot of themes, hasn't it? Yeah. Also, we forgot to mention that line when Tyrion says, and now my watch begins. Oh, yeah, that was so good. We said it in the episode. How fucking great that was. Yep. That was so good. Yep. Which, it's, which is really sad because he has no idea that Mormont's dead. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love that. That was such a great line. Mm-hmm. The doll that sits next to Sansa Stark's mirror in her first scene of the episode is the same one that her father, Eddard Stark, gave to her as a gift back in Lord Snow. Though at the time she said she was too old to play with dolls, Eddard said it was made by the same toy banker who produces the dolls for Marcella. So it's the same doll that Ed, Eddard, uh, made for her. It's mm. basically, she, you imagine why she'd keep it because it's one memory that she has of him. Sansa apparently covered Tyrion with a blanket sometime after he passed out on the couch, unless he got up in the middle of the night. But it's strongly implied that we are later shown when he first wakes up. 
That's nice of her. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. You chose not to rape me, therefore I'm going to keep you warm at night with a blanket. <laughs> <laughs> As your reward. Anyway, Sansa stated that she was 13 years old when Cersei asked her in the first episode of season 1. Two seasons later, she says that she is 14, not 15. Other statements imply a general rule that one season equals one year within the storyline, so it might simply be, be that almost two years have passed, and Sansa herself has just reached her 15th name day yet. So she's... I suppose you'd have to go with the logic that at the start of season one, she had just turned 13, and she's about to turn 15 now. Mm -hmm. But the timeline is very odd in this show. And it gets worse as time goes on, believe me. Yeah. Not sure if you're aware of that or not, but there are some very strange things about the chi about the timeline. <laughs> this is the first time that Samuel Tarly's father has explicitly re been referred to in dialogue as Randall Tarly. Sam just refers to him as my father in seasons one and two. Lord Randall's name was first mentioned in dialogue by Davos Seaworth in the season two premiere, though he didn't mention that he had a son named Samwell. The significance of dragon glass is finally revealed. The substance is lethal to white walkers. The cache of dragon glass daggers was discovered at the Fist of the First Men and the Prince of Winterfell um, exactly one season ago, but none of those who found it had any guess as to what its purpose. TV viewers might think it foolish that Sam left the dragon glass dagger on the ground where the white walker died instead of recovering such a valuable weapon. In the book, Samwell only had one dragon glass dagger, which Mormont gave him as he was dying, and indeed recover it after killing the White Walker. However, the next time that Samwell appears in the uh, TV series, ah, uh, well, I can't say anything now, because that's spoilers. <laughs> well, there you go then. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, the White Walker appearing in this episode is visually identical to the one that Sam encountered at the Battle of the Fist of the First Men. However, Gilly says that he is here to take her son, suggesting that he is the same one that Jon Snow encountered at Craster's Keep. The White Walker was portrayed by Ross Millen, and was also the White Walker in Valor Magulis, so it can be assumed that it is meant that the same character was there in the Nightlands as well. Even though yeah, the Craster's White Walker was played by Ian White, they are the same character. Despite the fact that they play the same character as two different actors in the same season. Yeah. Very interesting. Very odd. This episode was nominated for the 2013 um, Primetime Emmy Awards for Outstanding Hairstyling for a Single Camera Series. Obviously, there's a lot of hairstyling for the wedding. Tyrion referring to himself as the god of tits and wine. Which links <laughs> back to season two episode, The Prince of Winterfell, when he asked Varys that same question. Melisandre claims generally that there is power in King's blood, but does not specify what it is. In the novel, she claims it is power to wake stone dragons. It is unclear what these stone dragons, uh, fossilized dragon eggs, or stone carvings of dragons at Dragonstone. Hmm. Actual live leeches were used where Melisandre performs a blood ritual on Gendry. Live leeches were used because they appear in the close-up. Both she holds them and they crawl around on the actor's chest. The leeches which have been bitten into Gendry and attached to him, however, are not live leeches, but prosthetics. They would stop with the real leeches before they bit into him. Okay, now, th now this, this is an interesting one. Why did Tywin state that the bedding could be dispensed with? It is out of character for him to agree with Tyrion on anything. Perhaps he thought the bedding ceremony was not dignified enough for the Lannisters, or it brought back unpleasant memories of his late wife's bedding. According to Barris and Salmi, Eris acted indecently on that occasion, verbally and physically. I feel like to say that it's out of character for him to agree on with Tyrion on anything is a straw man. Yeah. Because he's agreed with Tyrion before. Yeah, he has. So that's dumb. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, trivia that, it, person that wrote that. Yeah, like, they've agreed on... It's probably, I think several things at this point. Well, if Tywin disagreed with literally everything he said, he'd be stupid. Yeah, because Tyrion's smart. He would be doing it to just be a contrarian, which he isn't. He just... His feelings... Uh, sometimes make the wrong decisions that he knows he probably shouldn't make. 
and also the disdain for him is like of course it's still there but again we also get scenes of him saying well he's still my my son he's still a Lannister mm -hmm. so yeah it's it's to say like he would never agree with Tyrion is really really dumb yep one of the names Sam suggests for Gilly's baby is Gaiman. This is perhaps an homage for the producer Gaiman Cassidy. Oh, a bit of bit of self-indulgence there. Uh, the Hound tells Aya that his brother once killed a man for snoring. This is perhaps a reference to the Old West outlaw John Wesley Harden, who allegedly shot someone for death for snoring. When that scene came on, I was thinking, would Vince McMahon kill someone for sneezing? <laughs> Because we know he hates seizing. Fuck, so sneezing. You're a wick. There's no such thing as days off. Anyway, viewership 5.1 overnight. Yay. That's a lot. It is a lot. That's a lot. So it's obviously recovered from last time. Give your conclusion and a rating out of 10 for Second Sons. Uh, for it was very solid and it was extremely hilarious. There was a lot of good direction uh, throughout the episode. And I think that there was a lot of individual scenes that I think were very very well done in terms of the storytelling with all the setup I think of previous scenes within the episode so it all makes it link together really well yeah I think this episode is really solid I think my main criticism is probably the, D the Daenerys story because I feel like that's really undercooked and underdone and feels very rushed other than that I'd say it's just really, really solid, and it's also extremely funny, so probably going to give it a 9 out of 10, because I think it's it's really good, and it, it was probably the one of the more, more entertaining episodes we've actually had. So yeah, 9 out of 10. Mm -hmm. it's good stuff. I have, very sim I have a very similar end. thought process in this, and that there are things I can criticise in that there, there's lacking in certain areas. However, mm -hmm. the highs are some of the best we've had the whole season, specifically King's Landing and the scene with Stannis Baratheon and Davos Seaworth. Those were some of my absolute favourite scenes so far this season. And the Daenerys stuff in Yunkai is lacking, but however, it's still not massively problematic, and I wouldn't say it goes down as deeply as the, um, the Karth one did at this juncture last time round, where the capture of the dragons of Pyat Pri became a bit excessive. Whereas with here, the story is still functional, however, I feel like it just misses a few beats. Um, mm -hmm. Overall, a very solid episode, and the wedding scene and the comedy in that and the performances in that <laughs> elevates it much higher than uh, than it would if it, did, if it wasn't there. Um, so like you, I'm also going to give it a 9 out of 10, uh, but only just. It only just gets there. What I think is frustrating about this is that I I have so much to say to criticize this episode, yet I still give it a 9, which may confuse people. And what I'm basically trying to say is, is that this is a really good episode, but when I criticize it, what I'm trying to say is, is that I think it could be even better. Because A Storm of Swords is one of the best novels I think has ever been written. And because they're missing that subtext, it's taking away what could have, you know, could be tens to nines, if you get what I'm saying. Would you say you you mm -hmm. agree on that front in the sense that it by lacking some of the subtext, it definitely reduces it from what it could be? Yeah, because it doesn't allow characters to develop to potential they could get to Daenerys for example feels very uh, what would the word be surface uh, level 
Yeah, little, I'm trying to uh, a sh- little bit static, a bit a bit like Stannis Baratheon. She's a little bit static. Yeah, static, and she's she seems more like an observer right now in her own story. Mm-hmm. Whereas at this juncture in the books, we're getting all these different monologues and thoughts from her about what's happening. Yeah, we don't, I don't know what her feelings are right now. Like, yeah, feeling towards the task at hand. She hit. She's. Uh, she has mm. like it's almost like Dario it's almost like it. Dario Naharis was the POV character in this which is which is weird because he shouldn't be yeah it's really weird I feel like what I'm not, obviously I'm not sure this happens in the book uh, but I would have really liked it if uh, they obviously give all three of them uh, a character other than I like women and the other one just not really being a factor they do this sort of like passive aggressive sort of story of like tension rising between the two and then you get a scene of him beheading the two sort of like I guess in a way it would it, uh, subvert your expectations but you can sort of hint at, about it throughout the episode mm-hmm I think this, what happened in this episode needed to be spread across two episodes and have more development. We needed yeah, to have time so. for her to think about everything that was happening and have time to her to speak to her advisors. Other than saying, kill him first. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. It's extremely undercooked. Yeah. But, having said that, everything else in the episode just elevates it massively because the the wedding in King's Landing was top class very interesting well unless you've got anything else to say shall we wrap up the video yeah I guess that's it I guess that's it well like the title of the theme of Lannister House the next episode which is called uh, season 3 episode 9 is called the Reigns of Castamere. I'm expecting a big episode because I feel like that this season hasn't had... Like, all the episodes have been good. They've all been really good. But we haven't had an episode that's blew me away in, a, in quite a while. In terms of plot? And if, like yes. Since Blackwater? Yeah, right. like that sort of like changes sort of, sort of the perspective of mm. the world right now, and also sort of like a big mm-hmm. character like satisfying well, I mean, moments I of mean, like kissed by fire yeah. was quite a big episode for all the characters, but it didn't do that much with the plot. Mm-hmm. I but want I a big saying. episode. You want a plot episode, is what you're saying? I want a I want a massive mm-hmm. plot episode. Yes, please. Because we've only got two episodes left, and we've got like, we've still got like three weddings to go through. <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> do you think we're gonna get it? Do you think we're gonna get a big episode? I think we will. Mm. I I I have faith that we'll get one big episode mm. in these next two nearly, episodes. We're nearly halfway through the the third book. Yeah. So we have to think: is there is there a big plot beat? in the middle of a storm of swords you got to ask yourself that question and if there isn't mm-hmm. would the showrunners force one in who knows mm. but yeah um unless you got anything else to say we can wrap it up there yeah that's all i've got to say all right then we'll see you all next time for the reigns of castamere <laughs>